We have been in a sermon series in the Gospel of Mark, and uh, my introduction today is to say, we're going to keep doing that, open your Bibles <laughs> to uh, Mark chapter 7. We've got lots of scripture to look at, an incredible story before us. I want to take you straight into it, and I don't think it needs much preamble at all. Let's meet Jesus, let's meet some of the people that he's going to be interacting with, and he's going to have a lot to teach us. Um, but I guess one thing I will say while you're finding it should be around page 814 or 815. I can confidently say Mark 1 is page 812, but I haven't looked in like four weeks to see where a page number is now. So 815 or so. I found um, sermons like last Sunday uh, on this side of the pulpit as a pastor, they're so much easier to preach because speaking to all of us, myself included, We want to receive the encouragement to have faith, to press on, that God's going to get us through all the hard things. Then we come to stories like this, and the challenge in studying and preparing for it is knowing that typically we are people that don't want to hear this sermon. (laughs) Our hearts are often closed because we, we want to be encouraged where we're doing well. We want to be told God is with us and he loves us. But when it comes to the parts of our lives we want to hide from him, we don't want to change and we want to cling to, those are good Sundays not to go to church. But we're going to touch on those things today because Jesus is going to drag us right into something that was happening 2,000 years ago that initially might not make a ton of sense to us. But I think we're going to explore it. We'll look at those 23 verses. And then with that understanding, what I want to do as we come to the Lord's Supper is just plant four things in your mind or your heart to wrestle with, things I've been thinking about this week. So apparently I did have an introduction. (laughs) Let's do this before we open up. How about we take a moment each to pray and just ask God to speak to you this morning through his word by his spirit about where you're at before him and the things he wants to continue to do in your life. Let's pray. So Mark 7, verse 1, let's dive right in and start to figure out what's going on here. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and they saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were, in quotes, unclean, that is, unwashed. Then in parentheses, Mark wants us to know this He says, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles, and of parentheses, back to our story. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? We'll pause. Let's dive in. We are now, even though we've only gone through six chapters of Mark's gospel, we're actually only a year from the crucifixion. When you put Mark's account with Matthew, Luke, and John, you find out a lot's happened that Mark hasn't recorded. But we're a year out which means there's been escalating tension between Jesus and a lot of the religious leaders. And on this occasion, we find Jesus in a similar position where there's been people sent to him to almost interrogate him or trap him, catch him saying something he shouldn't say, doing something he shouldn't do, professing something no one should profess. They want to trap him because they've already decided amongst themselves they want to kill him. They want him away. He's a problem. And in this moment, it's interesting because we're not just dealing with the Pharisees around the synagogues, around the Sea of Galilee, but there's a delegation sent from a long way off. Where from? Jerusalem, the important city, important people, likely sent by a group of men called the Sanhedrin, which was 71 men, including the high priest, that essentially regulated and oversaw the life of the Jewish people throughout Judea. And they were given some uh, measure of, we could say, power by Rome, along with accountability, to kind of manage uh, 
the Jewish people because Rome came to understand that's a volatile part of the world. And these people, um, like Sadducees, that's a title we hear often associated with the temple, were so troubled by Jesus, they sent this group representing them to figure out what's going on and to try and confront them. But what's interesting is though Jesus has been raising the dead and healing lepers and, and bleeding women and blind men and, and he's been casting out demons and teaching with great authority, they don't approach him on any of those things. What do they want to confront him on? Hand washing. And so that may seem really bizarre to us, but when we understand what's happening here, it becomes a little clearer what's taking place. And I want to say this is not about hygiene. This isn't the uh, bottle of hand sanitizer at the front of the church you squirt so you don't spread the flu. That's not what's going on. Mark tells us this is about ceremonial washing and everybody does it. The thing is, God didn't tell everybody to do it. Where this started, if you go all the way back to the Old Testament, the high priest was, was instructed in the law that before he came to the altar and he received everybody's offerings and mediated between them and God, the high priest was to wash himself, ceremonially cleanse himself to be able to serve God and others. And so what the religious leaders do is they say, well, if that's good enough for him, everybody should be clean, right? Everybody should have to be clean. They should wash their hands. And this is an example of traditions and rules and regulations that built up from the time of Moses so that these scribes, the Pharisees, they saw this tradition of the elders as an unbroken chain going all the way back to Moses. Rules and regulations on top of the word of God that were binding for everybody. So if we were Jewish people 2,000 years ago, we had the word of God, we had the Old Testament guiding us into life, and we had 613 regulations that made up the tradition of the elders, eventually put into a book form called the Mishnah in 200 AD. Of the 613 traditions, commands, regulations, whatever word you want to put in there, 365 of them were don'ts. Don't this, don't that, don't this, don't that, don't this, don't that. The rest of them is make sure you, make sure you, make sure you, right? And you lived your life under this tradition and it became a a burden. It was crushing, which is why Jesus would come and say, um, all who are weary, all who are heavy laden, come. I'll give you rest. And he says, take my yoke upon you. Because you weren't meant to live under this yoke. My yoke, he says, is easy. It's light. And so you have a group of people struggling under all of these regulations. And of the 613 regulations, 25% of them I read had to do with like cleanliness. And so how it worked, again, not about hygiene, but it says in Mark's gospel there, we just read it, they would come from the marketplace and what would they do? Wash their hands. If you read the regulations, it's because in the marketplace are unclean people and unclean things that will make you dirty. To the point where I might be in the marketplace and my hand might pass through the shadow of a sinner or a Gentile. Now I'm unclean. And when I sit at the table and I take my unclean hand and I grab my unclean food... I put that unclean food that touched my unclean hand, that touched the unclean person in the market, into my body. What do I become? Unclean, right? I become unclean too. And this is the thought. And so people lived under this burden of clean, unclean, 613 regulations, none of which given by God. And what do you think they lost sight of? God. Jesus bursts into this, and what we'll see as it unfolds is he has time for none of it. But as I reflect on it, I think it began with noble intentions. It began with people who probably said, we don't want to be corrupted by the world. Or they said, we want to be holy as God is holy. 
What does that look like? Good intentions, but somehow it ended up at a point where not only was the thought, if I go to the market and my hand passes through the shadow of a Gentile, I'm unclean, my food becomes clean, unclean, and I become unclean, but they actually prescribed for the ceremonial washing the kind of pot you had to use, how much water was in the pot, and the exact motion you had to make. A hand cupped into a fist and washing up your arm. And if you didn't do this stuff, you were unclean and God couldn't accept you. Again, it's not about hygiene. And there's so many different examples of this that we could find in Jesus in the midst of it. Verse 6, reading on, he replies to this important group of people that came all the way from Jerusalem. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written. And let me pause here. The words we're about to read, quoted from the prophet Isaiah. What we may not get, you need to understand, Jesus is quoting the word of God to the experts about the word of God. These are the people whose entire identity in life is bound up in studying the prophets and the law, teaching it to the people, and passing along this unbroken train or chain of regulations that dates back to Moses. And now he's referring, he's pointing them to the very word of God they pour over and saying, this is what you're missing. He's talking about you. These people honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, but their teachings are rules taught by men. And Jesus says, you've let go of the commands of God. You're holding on to the traditions of men. We'll pause. You've let go of what? Commands of God and in doing that, even the heart of God. To take hold of what? Yeah. Maybe you're saying, give me one more example of what that looks like. And Jesus does. He says to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say... If a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is Corban, that is a gift devoted to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and you do many things like that. So here's another thing that's kind of foreign to us. Um, So what he's pointing out here is an example to them of their hypocrisy, of their worship simply being lip service, but not rooted in their heart and certainly not the heart of God. So in the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, the Fifth Commandment, honor your father and mother. And as Jesus indicates here, God's, God's understanding of that would also include that as the parents age, especially in this culture, it's the responsibility of the children to provide care for mom and dad. But providing care for mom and dad means I've got to give up my stuff to mom and dad. How do I get around that? What the religious leaders did was they created another tradition, another law. Whereby if I took the portion of my income that should go to mom and dad, and I instead say, Corbin, I dedicate this to God. Well, now mom and dad can't have it. No one else can have it. But they also introduced a law that said, that part that's dedicated as Corbin, you can dip into it yourself. Do you see that? This is what Jesus was dealing with. God just said, honor your parents. And they found a loophole that allowed them to walk around saying, look how spiritual and righteous I am. Look at Carl. Carl's got his parents and he loves his parents, but he's so in love with God that he's taken the portion that could go to his parents and he's given it to God. To him be the glory. Look at Carl. Do you see it? 
we prop them up and we say, there's another box check for Carl. We need more Carls around. <laughs> and meanwhile, who's taking care of Carl's parents? Nobody thinking about honoring mother and father. Lost is the heart of God and his will because of all this traditions. I read this this week or read again this week of um, a, a blue crab. So I'm no biologist and I'm, I don't like seafood. But the blue crab, what I've learned is that it has to shed its shell. It molts its shell repeatedly in its life but especially when it's younger and it's growing. It's got this hard, rigid shell. Little crab inside's growing. And if it doesn't shed its shell, what happens? It dies. Because it's trapped into something that can't contain all it's meant to be. And it has to make itself vulnerable. It has to molt. It has to shed that shell and they read for a period of about 24 hours, one day, it, 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 the soft shell underneath hardens. And it can go through that next stage of life. Does that make sense? And it does this repeatedly, but as it gets older, it happens less because it's ne- ne- less necessary. And I think what's happening here in our story is we've got this situation where Jesus is looking and people are are. are caught in and bound and being crushed and oppressed within something that they needed to shed so they could grow to become all that God had for them to be. All of these regulations and traditions that have been thrust upon the people. So in this moment, he takes the attention off the religious leaders that had come to interrogate them and he calls the crowd closer. That's where his heart is. And he says this to the crowd. Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. Okay, what is that saying? Well, think back. If I go in the marketplace and I touch something unclean or I'm near someone unclean and I touch my food and my food goes in me and now this thing from outside of me has made me unclean, Jesus is saying that's not how it works. What matters is inside of you. That's the issue and that's the thing you're avoiding in the midst of all the lip service. So verse 17, he makes it even clearer. He says, after he left the crowd, he entered the house. His disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull? He asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out of his body. Jesus is now with his disciples, and he's saying, guys, look at this logically. Whatever comes in here is headed out the other direction, into a sewer, into a latrine. It doesn't touch your heart. It doesn't change who you are. I think he's saying the same thing about all these traditions and rules and regulations. They essentially belong in the same latrine in the same sewer, because they're holding people back. They're keeping them from knowing God and finding the life and the freedom that he has for them. And so he continues. He went on, Mark says, verse 20. What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts, women's hearts, come evil thoughts Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed and malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and make us unclean. Where's our problem? Inside. Before anything's a... An action before we do anything religious or righteous, it begins inside of us. And the story shows us that Jesus' ministry, perhaps much like our own times, is focused on external things. Uh, we, we as Christians get trapped into empty moralism. 
We think the Christian life is simply about us adapting our behaviors so that we can be pleasing and clean and God will accept us. That's all this is. And in the midst of it all is a story like this that should challenge us on many levels if we're willing to wrestle with it. The first thing I've been wrestling through is just this uh, concept of traditions and rules. Now, certainly we're not in the same context But I would argue even today, we all have traditions, we all have rules, we all have this is how it's been and this is how it should be. Every institution, any and every local church around the world. And I will also say that's not necessarily a bad thing. But when those things become law, when those things become consulted before the word of God, when those things put us in direct conflict with the people he's shaping us to be or the mission that he sent us on, we've got a problem. And these religious leaders had lifted up what was created by them, human, over the divine. And we call that in the scriptures idolatry. They had begun to leave God behind as they turned to their traditions, their rules, their ways of approaching God to be clean. And and again, it strikes me that this began likely with really good intentions. For example, God says, keep the Sabbath holy. God, God says, I've given you a gift. No other nation has this. A whole day of rest where you can love me and you can enjoy me and you can love one another and you can enjoy one another and you can reroute your life in me for everything that's going to come in the next six days. Keep the Sabbath holy. And then the good intention probably led to conversations like this. Okay, so I'm supposed to rest, but um, my sister lives three kilometers away. Can I walk? Hmm. I think we need a rule about that. So Carl and I get together and we decide you're only allowed this many steps on a Sabbath day, which is what happened. And then what's everyone thinking on the Sabbath day? How many steps have I taken? And then Carl comes and says, my goat fell in the well. That's my primary means of income. I say, well, am I allowed to help Carl on the Sabbath? We're going to need some rules about that because we want to honor God. And soon we've got 613 of them. And no one's enjoying the gift God gave. Right? Right? This is how it works. Um, Maybe we do this in our own communities today. Maybe this is something every generation's got to sort out. How do we honor God? How do we keep his word when it leaves some gray? I'm not going to speak to your view on this, and I want to be careful even in in giving examples of this in our context because I'm not intending to offend A lot of people have different ideas on what's right or what's wrong, even outside of the word of God and are living by your conscience. But but let me talk about my upbringing as a young kid. Whether I read it wrong or heard it wrong, my understanding was that a Christian is defined by everything they don't do. Christian doesn't wear makeup, doesn't dance, doesn't go to movies, doesn't play cards, doesn't drink a glass of wine, certainly doesn't associate themselves with them. On and on and on and on. Doesn't have a TV, doesn't have a VCR. Doesn't, 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 doesn't. I remember like pulling the covers over my head, listening to Flames games, wondering if I was going to hell because of a radio on. Everybody's going to have to figure that one out. But as I've grown up, I've seen, in a very real sense, those things discounted and obscured the beauty and the gospel of Jesus Christ in such a way where I feel, it doesn't make me true about this, but what I feel is I was in this culture where, hey, it's sure a lot easier not to put makeup on than it is to stop gossiping. Do you catch it? What's easier, stop going to the movie theater or start loving your enemy? 
and the boss who treats you like garbage at work, whatever it is. And all of a sudden, what we do is we've got our ways of doing things, and a Christian always, and a Christian never. None of it explicitly said in Scripture, but we're now box-checking here. And what we're missing is everything He has for us. And we're in a shell that is killing us because we got to shed it, we got to molt it, we got to move on, even though it's scary and it's vulnerable, into the things that He has for us. Because what he says about his commands is they always lead to freedom. They, they grow us into the maturity and the likeness of Jesus where the life that's really life is found. And so I want to say in terms of traditions and rules, and I'll say church policies, whatever it is. I'm not talking about the, the, the beliefs we have rooted in the scripture, but how we interpret those things and apply them into a lot of different situations Live according to your conscience in those areas, but do not prescribe them unto others as a measure of righteousness. We've got to be very careful that everything we believe, everything we practice, all of our traditions, our rules, our policies are always subject to the word of God and held under the light of scripture and ready to be revisioned at any moment. If they are crippling us from being the people he called us to be or serving the mission he's given us. Second area, I told you I'd be stomping on toes, is hypocrisy. Another area we don't like to think about. I am rationing about that much water. Um, hypocrisy, the word in the Greek, is, is the same word for actor. I've, I've shared this with you before. So a hypocrite is someone who is a part of a production and has to hide who they really are by putting a mask on. And Jesus said to these religious leaders, you hypocrites, you're two-faced. You present yourself as one thing to everyone else, but before God, you're something entirely different. And one of the questions I've been asking myself is, do I value appearance over reality? And to some degree, I think there's always going to be this gap between me who I am right now and who God's turning me into. By the grace of God, I'm not who I was. I know God sees me through the perfection of his son. I'm seen before the eyes of God as pure and spotless and blameless. Those things are true. One day to stand before his throne, not because of my works, but because of what Jesus has done for me, as we'll celebrate soon. But here and now, I'm still a long way off from the man he's making me. So that gap remains... And I feel like I've got blinders on throughout my life that God keeps removing scales from my eyes that allow me to see things that I've been covering or things I need to leave behind and molt, right? So that's always going to be true as I come more like Jesus. What he's talking about here are areas where we know what we're doing and we hide it because we don't want to molt it. We don't want to shed it. We don't want to leave it behind. And at that point, all we're doing is managing our image. We're living a lie. When the inner life and the outer life become separated, we no longer are integrated. That's the word for integrity. We're no longer together. We're pretending to be something we're not, which is why Jesus called the religious leaders whitewashed tombs. He said, you scrub the tomb, but inside, while the outside looks good, it's full of dead man's bones. Or he said, you're like a cup. You've cleaned it. It looks perfect to everyone else, but inside it's filthy because you take no time to deal with what's inside. The question that's on my heart this week is where do I have areas in my life where I'm not integrated, where I lack integrity because I'm presenting or I'm playing a game? Todd gave me this illustration. Thanks for whoever brought this water. (laughs) Todd told me a really funny story about himself that I'm more than glad to tell you. When Todd was younger, he told me he hated washing his hands. <sighs> Where is he? Hated washing his hands. So what he would do is this. He would um, go into the bathroom, and he knew he's supposed to wash his hands, so he'd just run the water, turn the water off, leave. Thought about it more, and he realized, but someone c- could come in and see the soap. <laughs> 
So then it became turn the water on, run the water for a bit, splash some water on the soap so you get suds. <laughs> One thing led to another. The charade continues till Todd realizes it's way more work <laughs> than just washing my hands. And on top of all of the work and effort and the hiding and the lying, I'm actually not getting the reward of clean hands. Isn't that our story? And God's saying, put down your mask, quit pretending, talk to me about what's underneath, let's tackle it together by my word, by the power of my spirit. Let's make you well. Second thing, and that was just a year ago, and look at Todd already. (laughs) Clean hands or clean heart. God's way is to always work from the inside out. Um, Romans 12, be transformed by washing your hands. By renewing your mind. Before anything's in action, it's a thought. It's something we're wrestling through. It's a desire that lurks. It, it's a temptation. And that's where the battle's fought. Not in the pretending in the marketplace. Which of these two things has your attention in this season of life? Clean hands? Or clean heart. Maybe you're saying, I don't know how to answer that. I'd say look at what matters. Or maybe compare your public life with your private life. If your public life is, I go to small group and I go to church and I help here or I help there. But when I'm alone, what's left? How's prayer life? Does God still matter when no one's watching? The Bible's still important. Meeting Him in His Word. Setting aside space to Think about the things and meditate on the truths that are in the word and have God speak into your life about things you got to molt and leave behind and shed. Is there confession of sin? How about serving in the small things throughout the day when there's no praise or recognition? Are we the same person behind the music stand on Sunday morning as we are in the back of a, a long Starbucks line that's taking too much time on a Monday morning? Are we interested in appearing righteous? Or are we interested in pursuing righteousness? Are we caught up in lip surf service, the superficial stuff? Or is God integrating our lives deep within to who he wants us to be? And here's the last thing, the mistake of the Pharisee, I'll call it. And it should be mistakes. There's many of them, and I don't say that arrogantly or condescendingly looking down on the Pharisee because I find I can relate often. One place we find some mistakes of the Pharisee is in Luke chapter 18. The Pharisees are introduced in the story this way, as people confident of their own righteousness and looking down on everyone else. There's two mistakes. The first mistake of the Pharisee is being confident in their own righteousness. They didn't see themselves as needing God's mercy They were proud. They were arrogant. They kept the rules. They checked the boxes. They were clean. They missed the Savior. That first mistake naturally leads into the second mistake, which is I checked all the boxes and look at everyone who hasn't. You get to look down on everyone else. You get to Look down your nose on everyone because you see what you've done well and you see what everyone else does poorly. Those are a couple mistakes, but I think the mistake that lies even underneath that is found in the actual title Pharisee because it describes who they are perfectly. Do you know what the word Pharisee means? Uh, It means to separate. So they found community, they found each other, and they gathered around this purpose of separating they essentially defined themselves by what they stood against, politically, spiritually, physically, 
They separated from food. They separated from people. They separated from sinners. They separated from those things and those people that were unclean, from Gentiles, from opposing systems of belief or ideologies, from cultures, from Rome, from everything. They separated. The problem is what they ended up separating towards was their traditions, their rules, and not the person of Jesus Christ. And so in this sermon series, as we think about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, I want to say to you, maybe you've experienced some of what you've heard Jesus uh, attacking here. The call of Jesus to follow him, the call, the invite of, of the Christian faith is not to separate yourself from everything dirty so you can just check some rules, be a good moralist, and try and earn your way to heaven by being clean. That's empty. There's no life in that. That's not the life Jesus came to give. The Christian life is that we would be holy as he is holy. The word church is ecclesia. It's called out ones. Those gathered out of the world called not to rules and traditions and to empty moralism, but to the person of Jesus Christ who makes us clean. And we become more and more and more and more like him with ever increasing day more and more like him as we molt, as we shed, as we leave behind us the sin that entangles and all the traps we used to fall into. We leave it behind in pursuit of Jesus who makes us clean and sends us back into the world, not to be of the world, but in the world and help others know there's life in him. Do you know he said to these religious leaders, You'll cross the face of the earth to make a convert, and when you do, you turn them into twice the son of hell they were before. Because they're saving people to rules. They're saving people to traditions. They're saving things that only further bound them. And what they were missing is that we're called to separate ourselves to Jesus, who's lived for us, who shed his blood for us, who's covered our sins so that we can be clean before God who's modeled for us the life of love that we now are called into, who's put his spirit into us, who one day will return for us, who will bring a kingdom one day where there's no more suffering and sorrow and sin and shame and temptation and traps. But here and now, this table reminds us we are called not to our traditions and not to our it's always been this way. We're free of that. Shed it. Leave it behind. And pursue Christ. Amen. That's where the life's found. By separating ourselves to him. By abiding in him so that we would be right with him. Right with others. Right with ourselves. And even right with creation around us. Shalom is what the Bible calls it. That's the adventure of discipleship. And I lived a lot of my early Christian years trapped in the other And I feel like life began when I shed that shell. And that's why I get worked up and almost start yelling in sermons like this. I love you guys and I don't want you stuck. Jesus came to give abundant life. I've tasted it. I've tasted the other. I never want to go back. And so we come to this table not in our self-righteousness, not through our traditions and our rules, not even because we're better than someone else, not because we've checked more boxes, not because even we've kept the commands of God better than someone else. We come by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We worship here. We offer our songs. We sing. We pray. We ascribe um, the, the, the glory to the God who has done this for us. We don't come with the pride of the Pharisee or the scribes from Jerusalem. We come like the people we met last week, Jairus and the bleeding woman, who'd taken hold of Jesus by faith, saying, if I I just reach out to him, he'll make me clean. Or the woman whose story follows this encounter. And as we come, I realize, too, even in preaching a sermon like this and hitting some heavy topics, it may be that you arrived um, lighter than you are right now. Maybe this sits heavy because you're like, I've got some hypocrisy I'm just starting to see now. Or there's things that I need to leave behind. I'm hiding it. 
I need integrity in my deepest places. And now maybe this sits heavy on you. And what I want to tell you is that when we confess our sin, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Shed it, leave it behind. It's covered by the blood of Christ. Press on into the life he has for you. Amen? Let him deal with that. Carry it no more. Come to this table knowing you're cleansed, you're forgiven. And let's celebrate that he has made us clean. May our prayer even be that of David who did a lot of hiding before God over a period of his life. And at the end of it came to God with these words. Would you read them with me? Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all of my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Amen.